Um, well, so we are in this series, Growing Up Jesus, and we are in moments, key moments in Jesus' life as he was growing up. We're in the Gospel of Luke this year, and so we actually get some of these moments. But before we dig into God's Word, I want to I take a moment just to talk briefly about something that I, th- I think kind of one of the things we do as a congregation that maybe makes us unique, at least in, in our community, especially here in Grain Valley. It kind of sets us apart from the local churches, but actually connects us to the historic church and historic Christian communities going all the way back to the time of Jesus. So if you were watching our Facebook page last week, you saw on Thursday that we posted about the Epiphany on January 6th. So Epiphany was like the first event of 2022 in the Christian calendar. It celebrates the visit of the wise men, the magi to the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And so as a, we're, we're considered a mainline denomination. And what that means is we have a strong connection to the historic church. We're kind of on the main line of churches that go all the way back to the apostles. And, and as that kind of a church, Methodism historically follows the Christian calendar. It's a calendar with seasons and, and special days that allow us every year we walk through, as a people of God, the life of Jesus Christ. So it starts in Advent with his birth and takes us all the way then to Easter with his resurrection and then his ascension. But then all that summer, the big long summer where everything's green forever in the church, that's ordinary time where it's all about us learning to be like Jesus. And so we literally, as a congregation, number our days by the life of Christ. And so here we are now in what we call the season of Epiphany, the days after Epiphany. And so you'll see that a lot of the scriptures that we'll be reading in the coming weeks, they'll look at the revelation of Jesus to the wider world. Like so, that, so we'll read scriptures where Jesus is being made known to others, like happened when the Magi visited the Messiah. They were the first Gentiles to, to experience and know the Messiah had come. And then, like Dina said at his baptism, others then witnessed Jesus being um, baptized and proclaimed as the coming Messiah. I mean, John the Baptist told them there's one coming who I'm not even fit to tie or untie his shoes, right? And so today is a special day within the season of Epiphany. It's the baptism of the Lord Sunday. And so the symbols that you see like on the screen, on the banners, on our kids' um, stoles when they're acolyting, they all remind us of Jesus' baptism. But also they invite us, like Dina did, to consider and remember, if we can, our own baptism. So speaking of that, how many of you can remember if you've been baptized before? How many of you can remember your baptism. There comes that envy of mine welling up in, inside. If you have children in your life, how many of you remember their baptism? Yeah, and how many of us then, when we got it, this is the quiz for today, how many of us remember what happened at Jesus' baptism? Right, okay, so, so who remembers, where was he baptized? Jordan River, right. And who baptized him? John the Baptist. Man, you guys are good. All right. And how old was he? Right, like right around 30. Around when Jesus was about 30. Is actually. And then who else was there? Oh, yeah, a lot of people. The Spirit. God, thank you. See, that's you. Did you not go to Sunday school? That's all. Oh, that's the answer for everything. God. <laughs> and Jesus was there, right? Always. Right? And, 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 and what happened? Heaven. Dude, you got bonus points back in the back. Heaven opened up. Right. So here's one of the cool things you maybe knew or didn't know. Jesus' baptism is one of only four events that occur in all four Gospels, that are recorded in all four Gospels up to the last week of Jesus' life. That's in all four. But before that, there are only four things that happen that are written down in all four Gospels. One of them is Jesus' baptism. One of them is actually John the Baptist preparing the way. And um, points next week if you come back and tell me the other two without Google. Um, but this um, today, this scripture today, is from Luke chapter 3. We're going to read 15 through 22. And this is what we read. As the people were filled with expectation... 
And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Then we get a flashback. Now, when all the people were baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today to hear from you that we might remember what you have done for us, what you are doing in us, and what you have called us to do to bring others to you. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So did that story from Luke then sound pretty familiar? Yeah? Did anything sound different? To you, did anything stick out that maybe you didn't remember about this story? Because Luke's gospel, his account of the baptism, is a bit different than the other gospel writers. It's different in a way, I think, that really points to the heart of both Jesus' baptism and our baptisms. So in the time remaining, we're going to look at three, I think, powerful truths that we can learn about the baptism of the Lord and the our baptisms and the baptism of our loved ones through, Jesus, through Luke's story of Jesus' baptism. And so know this, Jesus' baptism and our baptisms are two very different things. And so one, we're going to learn that Jesus' baptism connected him to the history of God's people, going back all the way to the waters of creation. We're also going to learn that Jesus' baptism changed the history of God's people. Jesus' baptism changed everything. And finally, it's a funny word, but our baptism is a sign act. We may choose when we experience the sign, or our parents may choose for us, but we have no control over the act that the sign points to, because it points to something that we didn't do, we didn't earn, and we don't necessarily always deserve. So first, Jesus' baptism connects him to history. I think that sometimes it's easy to miss, especially in Luke's version of the story, because the actual baptism part of Luke, in Luke's version, happens pretty quickly at the end of this moment. Blink, and you'll miss it. Or if you jump just to it, you'll miss the other stuff. Like, here's what Luke says about the moment of Jesus' baptism. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also was baptized and was praying, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. That's it. And actually, as far as the baptism moment is concerned, it really could read, when all the people were baptized, so was Jesus. That's kind (laughs) of a letdown for that monumental moment, right? But, But for a lot of us, too, by the way, I think, does anybody, this, this image, I think, this 1950s white Jesus and this impossibly dry John the Baptist in the water <laughs> kind of captures <laughs> the visuals of, of Jesus's baptism, right? I think sometimes this is all you think of. You think the Jordan River, Jesus, John, and a dove, and then God's voice. That's it. Those are the essentials. Those are the things what happened, that happened, but that misses a key detail that, that Luke provides. That Dina, you just told us, right? That they aren't alone. 
that there are other people, all the people, Luke says. And when, and when John the Baptist comes out, crowds of people, crowds of Jews came down to the Jordan to be baptized by John. So really, I wonder if it looked more like this when Jesus was baptized. I mean, if drones existed in Jesus' day, you could play Where's Waldo, maybe with Jesus, in the crowds of people being baptized. You see, Luke is pointing to the fact that what Jesus experienced with John was not unique to Jesus. It really wasn't anything that new, because by Jesus' day, there were a number of ways that Jewish people might have experienced something like baptism. For starters, if you were a Gentile convert to Judaism, a proselyte you might read in the New Testament, you would have undergone baptism as a ritualized symbol where you were washing away all the things about you that were considered impure or unclean by the Torah. Priests at the temple would wash their hands and their feet before performing sacrifices. There were ten special, what you might call basins or fonts, before carrying out their ritual sacrifices they would go to, like when they sacrificed the two turtle doves when Jesus was 40 days old. And everyday Jews would ritually bathe themselves if they had come into contact with external impurities, such as blood, or if they'd been in contact with the dead. In fact, this is kind of cool. Archaeologists just found this one like two years ago, but they found hundreds of mikvahs. They're like Jewish ritual immersion pools. From Jesus' day around Galilee and Judea, they found hundreds of these. And yeah, this one was just from a couple years ago. They're building a house, and they're like, oh, look, what's in the foundation? Can we have a pool, Dad? Right? They did back then. So ritually cleansing yourself by immersion in water was nothing new. Chances are that Jesus had seen priests do it at the temple. Remember, they would go every year with his family. He might have seen some Gentile converts baptized. He might have been immersed in a mikvah after maybe tending to a diseased relative or helping his dad butcher for dinner. He would have ritually bathed. But then his cousin John did something different. While mikvahs were typically used for external impurities and uncleanliness, when John began baptizing Jews in the Jordan, he was calling them to repent of their sin in preparation for the Messiah. And by repenting, they're changing their hearts and lives, and the waters of the Jordan became a sign or a symbol of that inner change the sign and the symbol of something that's happening inside of us. So instead of immersing themselves at the water of a mikmah to become externally clean, John's baptism represented an internal, moral purification of sorts. So how many of us think about that today when we think of baptism, that it's an outward sign of our internal decision to change our hearts and lives? Yeah, that's a very common understanding of what baptism is, an outward expression of our internal decision. That's the baptism that Jesus came to experience from John the Baptist. This, by the way, here, this is Lily on, on the day she was baptized. It was June 4th, 2006. We were in a Methodist church in Muncie, Indiana. Now, she's a year and 10 months at this point, so I'm not exactly sure if she was making an outward profession of an inward decision at that point. Actually, looking at the picture, I'm really impressed she made the decision not to be holding a pacifier because that was a rare occurrence in her life. But what I remember most about this moment was that the pastor brought out a bottle of Evian water <laughs> to use at the baptism. And I was thinking, man, does he know something about the water in Muncie that we did not know? <laughs> but it, it, it felt awkward. But then he explained that he had brought back dozens of these bottles. Every time he would visit Israel, he would fill them with water from the Jordan River and bring them back to the States. And so like Jesus and the rest of the crowd that day, Lily was baptized with water from the Jordan River. Right? That blew my mind. Anybody else here ever been in the Jordan River? Sometimes we'll get some people. Aha! Did you go to the baptism place where you could? Yeah, that's cool, right? And you got the water bottle? There you go. Could I borrow that next time? <laughs> right? That's awesome. But so here's the thing. It, it, it doesn't end 
with Jesus this moment, the significance of this moment. Remember, Jesus' baptism connected him to the history, not just of crowds baptized by John or the crowds of Israelites who'd been immersed in mikvahs or the Gentiles baptized at conversion. No, by baptizing Jews in the Jordan, John was connecting them back to other key moments when God was doing something new in the history of the Hebrew people. So, right, the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters at creation or the flood, washing the whole earth clean of humanity's sins, or Moses leading the people literally through the waters of the Red Sea as they, as they escaped slavery and bondage in Egypt. And, of course, the big one, Joshua leading the Israelites across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. They went down into the waters of the Jordan and then came back out out a new people washed clean from their past mistakes restored to the land of their ancestors so you see jesus being baptized in the jordan river physically and symbolically connected the messiah to the story of god's people contained in scripture jesus's baptism connects him to the history of god's people going back to creation But then again, Jesus' baptism changed the history of God's people. Jesus' baptism changed everything. I mean, like, yeah, Jesus was just one of many in the crowd that day of people being baptized when he walked out into the wilderness, but something happened to Jesus that didn't happen to anyone else there that day. This, This is my son, John. Now, I feel really bad, and I, I spent, well, it was a Clark Griswold moment. Uh, but this is John around the day he was baptized. I feel horrible. I could not find a picture because I didn't take one because I was, you know, with him. Uh, but I know we have one, so I just have to find it. So family, um, if you're watching, <laughs> hit me up. But um, no, this is actually John in the waters of VBS at the church where he was baptized this summer. He was baptized, you can see, First United Methodist Church in Warrensburg. And John was surrounded by family at his baptism. In fact, it was kind of a, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's a cool story. We had kind of a Simeon at the temple moment for our family with John and his baptism because my grandmother was there and she was in the final stages of Parkinson's, but she had seen and vi- been there for every one of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren's baptism. She had made that trip, and she was determined to be there. And if you knew my grandmother, you knew if she was determined to be there, she was going to be there, right? Despite what her children thought, despite what the doctors said, she got on a plane from California, and she flew to Missouri, and she saw the child she had been waiting for blessed in the temple. And I'm I'm not joking, she died like two weeks later after she got back um, home. I'm so thankful that she was there um, to experience that. How many of us were surrounded by family at our baptism or surrounded our family at their baptism? Jesus, though? I mean, not so much. Right? I mean, I guess you could count John, right? Cousin. That works. But no Mary, no Joseph, no James the Just, just Jesus and, and the crowds. But, but, but there were two other persons there that day, right? Two others who were closer to Jesus than family is to us. Two others who, along with Jesus, have been present at everyone's baptism ever since Jesus' baptism. And who are they? You got God. See, you, you learn now. And, and who else? The Holy Spirit. Right. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove. Some of my favorite lines in scripture. A voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And that moment changed everything. 
for the first time in recorded history, the heavens opened up and the Holy Trinity is all in one place, all in one time on earth amongst God's people, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ the King is anointed in those waters. The Spirit is upon him in those waters and his Father, like countless parents, down through the time on the day of their child's baptism said, you are mine. I love you, and you make me happy. And from that moment on, Jesus begins his ministry. Miracles begin to happen. People are healed. The lame are made to walk. The dead will rise again. Jesus' baptism inaugurated his ministry, and it began what we sometimes call the Messianic Age, where the Messiah has come. And we have witnessed on earth the kingdom of God. Our sins will be washed away. We will be welcomed into the family of God, into the body of Christ. We will be given the Holy Spirit. Everything is changed. And it's why Luke did something kind of weird, if you didn't catch it. Luke had to finish John the Baptist's story before he could like backtrack and get back to Jesus' baptism. Right? Did you all hear that? He's like, John is saying, hey, his winnowing fork, he's going to purify us with fire, which is actually a good thing. Jesus comes and burns away all that is, all that is sinful, all that is unworthy, all that is unnecessary amongst us. It kind of sounds scary. I'm always like, oh, that's not good news, burning us, but it is. It's the best news. We're purified. And so we hear John the Baptist, and then we hear what happens to John the Baptist. He gets arrested and then John the Baptist's story is done for Luke. And it's all Jesus, because it's a new age, a new time. The world and all God's people have been immeasurably changed. Something new has happened. Which brings us to our baptism. And the first thing we need to know is that our baptism, in, in our tradition, we call baptism a sacrament a sacred event in our lives, a holy moment that was instituted by Jesus. It's something we're commanded to do, right? Go therefore and make disciples, baptize them. It's something that we call a sign act. But unlike the baptism that John was offering, our baptism is not a sign of anything that we've done. Our baptism is not a sign of anything that we've done it's not a sign, ultimately, of our changed hearts and lives. Jesus transformed that meaning. He transformed the waters so that now our baptism is a sign not of what we have done, but what, of what God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has done. That's what a sacrament is. It's ultimately not about anything we've done. It's not even about a decision that we've made. It's about something that God has done for us and is doing in our lives. So some of you know this girl. This is Sophia Joy. And I had to say her middle name because of the smile on her face. This is Sophia Joy on her, the day of her baptism in the swimming pool slash hot tub. Um, June 7th, 2020. Here. Or outside at, at, at Faith. And like Jesus, the waters in which Sophia was immersed incorporated her into the whole salvation history of God's work in humanity. Did you get that? Like from the waters of creation to the Red Sea to the Jordan to the Promised Land to John the Baptist and Jesus and the waters that Jesus calmed like Sophia went into those waters. She went into those stories. But unlike Jesus, when Sophia went under the waters, she was dying to her old self, just as Christ had died. And when she emerged out of those waters, and it was slow-mo if you were there and her hair did the thing, right? She was resurrected into a new life, just as Jesus was resurrected. We die with Christ and we rise again in the waters of baptism. Sophia's baptism, though, was a sign that didn't point to her actions, right? Right? but it pointed to God's mighty acts in her life and the life of her spiritual ancestors. 
This is Griffin and Benjamin on the day of their baptism. This was this, well, last year now, I guess, June 19th, 2021, here. And like Jesus, Benjamin and Griffin were not alone. There was a crowd of people at the church that day. And like Jesus, Griffin and Benjamin were surrounded by those closest to him. Closest, close, surrounded by the ones that called them beloved and who found joy in these two young boys. It's hard not to find joy in those guys. But unlike Jesus, when the waters poured out over Griffin and Benjamin, they were incorporated into Jesus' body. Like they were brought into the body of Christ, the family of God. They are now related to everyone in the history of Christianity who has been in those waters. They have a new family, an eternal family, and the beauty of that is they need never be alone. Never be alone. And this was not because of something that Benjamin did or Griffin did. This wasn't even because of something their parents did. No. Their baptism is a sign of God's gracious gift to God's children. And sometimes we say, how can a child be baptized if they don't even, they're not even old enough to express their faith? And then Jesus looks at you and says, what did I say? If you only had faith like these children. Now this is your baptism. Do you remember it? Do you remember how, like Jesus, God the Father looked down on you that day and said, you are my child. I love you. You make me happy. And like Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended upon you like a dove on that day. And the Spirit hasn't left you since. You have been anointed. You have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And like the day of Jesus' baptism, on the day you were baptized, everything changed. You've been forgiven. Your past is washed away. A new path has opened before you. The Spirit has empowered you to live the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, to grow closer and closer to the image of God in which you were created, to live in such a way that others might see in you the kingdom of God that walked the earth in the three years following Jesus' baptism. You see, baptism is a sign act. Only it's not a sign of any act or action you have taken. No, it's a sign of the mighty acts that God has been doing in our lives since the Spirit hovered over the waters and the Word spoke all things into existence. It's a sign of the acts of salvation that Jesus Christ performed in his time on earth, acts that he performed for you. And this sign points to the acts that the Holy Spirit is enabling you to do in the time that you walk this earth. Acts that themselves will serve as signs to all who witness them, pointing them to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that they might know the Trinity, that they might be baptized, that they might become a sign, that again, they might be empowered to do things that point others to God. And so today, it's a day to remember that. On the day we remember Christ's baptism, We also remember that our baptism is a sign of all the mighty acts that God has done for us and of all the mighty acts that God wants to do through us, through you. Amen? Amen.